Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to uh, my talk today. And thank you to the uh, organizers for the invitation to uh, speak. My name is Eric Smith. I am the lead bioinformatician for annotation at uh, Diversigen. We are a microbiome sequencing and bioinformatics services company. And I wanted to talk to you today um, about a new database we've developed. Uh, we're calling it DivDB Mouse. Um, div for Diversigen, DB Mouse, um, that was developed specifically to uh, profile um, the microbiome of mice um, for mouse studies. Um, so mm -hmm. I probably don't need to uh, belabor this point too much, uh, given the audience, but uh, model organ organisms in science um, have proven uh, pretty invaluable in the insights they've given us, um, and they're very useful. Uh, because they are very tractable, they're manipulable in ways that are uh, unethical and impossible to do in humans. Um, they generally have very short generation times. Um, you're able to rear them to very large numbers um, in a lot of cases, so um, you increase the power of, of your studies. Um, and in most cases, you're able to house them in um, very small rooms within a lab, so they're, they're very, very tractable. Um, and for these reasons, um, we as scientists, the, the royal we as scientists, have developed a variety of model organisms to study different aspects of uh, biology. So there's the sort of classical uh, Drosophila melanogaster for studying genetics and development. Uh, there is the bobtail squid and its resident uh, Vibrio fisheri um, for studying host microbe interactions. Uh, zebrafish have been uh, very valuable um, for studying development. Um, and um, particularly in regards to human health, uh, mouse models have been very invaluable. So um, this is just a smattering of models that we use um, in science, uh, but they've been used to study aspects of biology from very basic things like uh, gene inheritance to much more advanced things like how do neurons function and um, speak to each other. Um, how does an immune system respond to invading pathogens? How do diseases develop? How does cancers, cancers develop? Um, things like that. Um, and it's these more sort of advanced aspects of biology where mice have um, really proven invaluable, um, owing largely to the fact that 99% of mouse genes, or greater than 99% of mouse genes, have homologs in humans. Um, so we're able to manipulate expression of these genes and um, study phenotypes in mice and then start to ascertain um, how different genes might be functioning in humans. Um, and because of this, um, there have been a number of mouse models developed that mimic human diseases, um, uh, things like Alzheimer's disease, uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, various different kinds of cancer, uh, diabetes, uh, obesity. Um, again, this isn't an exhaustive list, um, but these are just some of the things um, that mice have been used to study. And in recent years, it's becoming increasingly apparent um, that mice are a really good model for the human microbiome. Um, so on the right here, you see the sort of four um, model species that I uh, had talked about a few slides ago, as well as the human. Um, and you see, um, as we move from left to right, we um, increase in both the complexity of the microbiome and um, how the uh, microbiome starts to resemble the human microbiome. So we start with squid, which only have one resident microbe, uh, Vibrio fisheri. And then as we move to Drosophila, we start to get a little more diverse into zebrafish, is even more diverse than Drosophila. And then what you see with the mice is that they are um, quite diverse and they really start to resemble the human microbiome. And for these reasons, uh, mouse models have been um, used to study the role of the microbiome in angiogenesis, uh, obesity, um, things like immune function, uh, brain development and behavior, um, responses to injury and wound healing. Um, and again, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are um, some of the things that they've been used to study. However, um, we're currently slightly limited in um, studying the mouse microbiome. Um, so as we study the human microbiome, it's very important that we are very specific, specific and um, sensitive to changes in the microbiome and how those might be impacting the phenotypes we're seeing. And the best way to get this specificity and sensitivity is by um, shotgun um, whole genome metagenomic sequencing. Um, the issue right now is that shotgun databases are um, 
largely biased towards human derived microbes. So human pathogens, human commensals, things like that, because those are most likely where people are to uh, put their resources in terms of sequencing microbes um, and depositing um, genomes into public repositories. Um, and this is reflected um, on the left here um, in the number of 16S sequences available versus the number of whole genomes available. Um, so uh, this middle bar is the Silva database, which is a 16S repository. Um, there's a little over 9 million 16S sequences in the Silva database. Um, and even if you dereplicate all of those 9 million, you still have a little over 500,000 16S sequences. By contrast, the RefSeq database has uh, right around 200,000 full genomes. So we're at, you know, in terms of full genome representation, we're at about 40% um, of what we see in um, 16S representation. And when we map reads from um, mouse fecal samples to um, something like RefSeq, the proportion of reads that are able to be unambiguously identified to the species level is right around 10%. So pretty abysmal. Um, we at Diversigen set out to um, rectify that uh, by creating um, a database that we're calling, uh, like I said, DBDB Mouse. Uh, it was de designed specifically for shotgun sequencing, and it leverages a number of uh, different um, resources available, so um, MAGS, um, as well as um, high-quality um, full genome assemblies. Um, and as I'll show you in the coming slides, um, this database improves specificity of mo uh, mouse microbiome characterization and allows for um, accurate functional profiling, which is not currently um, available via 16S sequencing. So here's just a little um, outline of um, sort of how we created this database. So we took um, genomes from mouse-specific cell cultures, uh, high-quality MEGs, um, sequences from mouse microbiome sequencing projects, um, and then we manually curated and went through NCBI and selected a uh, number of uh, mouse microbial genomes. And then we coupled that with our Diversigen DB, um, which is essentially our RefSeq database, um, and went through a round of dereplication so we don't have um, strains that are over or underrepresented. Um, we classified all of them uniformly for taxonomy with GTDB. And then to develop the functional aspect of the database, we went through a round of gene prediction and functional annotation, um, and that all comes together to create our DivDB mouse. So how does this database perform? Um, so mapping rates are greatly increased when we use um, DivDB mouse versus um, just our sort of RefSeq representation. So on the left here, you see the organism aspects of the database. So um, when we take mouse fecal samples and map them to DivDB, we get mapping rates just above 10%. Um, and when we map to DivDB mouse, um, those increase to, um, you see here, just above 40%. Um, but what's really important is on the functional side of things, our mapping rates um, increase quite a bit. So we go from um, right around 2% mapping rates um, to the functional aspect of DivDB with mouse fecal samples to um, something closer to 16 or 17% um, when we map to the functional aspect of um, DivDB mouse. So um, here's just a per sample increase um, with those same samples. So um, like I mentioned, we see about a fourfold increase when we in mapping rates when we map to the organism database and we see about an eightfold increase when we map to the um, functional side of the database. Um, and importantly, um, when we take samples that were profiled via 16S um, and also profiled via whole genome sequencing, um, we see a huge increase in specificity at genus, species, and strain levels of taxonomy with DivDB mouse versus um, 16S profiling of the same samples. Um, so this gets back to um, really being able to start to tease apart different species or even different strains that might be involved um, in the phenotypes that uh, you're seeing in your studies. Uh, we at Diversigen are certainly not the first people to develop a mouse-specific database, so there are others publicly available. Um, I've highlighted three of them here. Um, but importantly for DivDB mouse, our mapping rates are significantly higher than um, all of the other publicly available um, mouse databases um, for shotgun sequencing. And uh, DivDB mouse um, helps to sort of close the gap between um, what we're able to profile in mouse studies versus what we're able to profile in human studies. So here on the left, you see um, when we map human samples to DivDB, which is again, um, essentially a RefSeq representation, 
we get mapping rates around 40%. Uh, but when we take mouse samples and map them to DivDB, um, like I've shown, we see mapping rates uh, just above like 12 or 13%. Um, but then when we take these same mouse samples and map them to DivDB mouse, we get mapping rates that are um, on par with what we see when we map human samples to uh, the human uh, DivDB database. And these aren't just um, like low abundance, you know, maybe unimportant species. Um, so what we've done here is uh, we mapped um, mouse fecal samples to DivDB. And then on the left here, I have highlighted the top 10 most abundant species um, in samples. And in green are the ones that were um, new additions that are present in DivDB mouse that weren't previously present in DivDB. And so you see of the top 10 most abundant species, four of them are um, actually new additions that are present in DivDB mouse um, that were not previously present in DivDB. And on the right, um, I've made a few notes about what these are. So actually three out of the four were recently identified in a uh, meta-analysis that went back and um, re-annotated reads from previous mouse metagenomic studies. Um, and a, they were able to identify three out of these four species. Um, so these are species that were present in those studies when those studies initially came out, but we didn't have genomes for them or we didn't know about them. So the reads were you know, either unclassified or classified um, as, or just completely unmapped to the database. So this is this is data that's there. Uh, we just like haven't been able to uncover it before. So the next thing we wanted to do was to compare um, 16S sequencing to um, using the sort of whole genome uh, metagenome sequencing of DivDB mouse. So we found a study. Um, here, this is the graphical abstract for the study. Um, basically, in the study, what they were trying to do is they, they trapped mice in the natural world um, and characterized their microbiome, and then they characterized the microbiome of lab mice from um, various different suppliers. Um, and they were hypothesizing that um, natural mice are exposed to a variety of challenges that lab mice aren't exposed to. And so this might mean that the microbiome in uh, natural mice might confer some sort of benefit to lab mice um, that previously wasn't conferred or wasn't present in lab mice. So um, after characterizing the microbiome, they took um, the microbiome of wild mice and reconstituted it in uh, germ-free lab mice. And they also reconstituted the lab microbiome in the germ-free lab mice um, just to see, you know, do, do they see an increase in fitness in the lab mice when they um, take the um, the microbiome of the wild mice and put it in the lab mice. And they did see an increase in fitness, but importantly for our purposes, there was a subset of samples that were profiled both via 16S and via whole genome sequencing. So we're able to make a very direct comparison of using whole genome sequencing with DivDB mouse versus using um, just 16S profiling. And so this is the slide I'd shown a little while ago where shotgun sequencing increases um, specificity over um, what we see via 16S sequencing. So we're able to pull out, you know, uh, much finer scale resolution um, and differences in taxonomy. Um, but I think one of the more interesting things to come out of this is, so uh, with strictly with functional profiling, so with DivDB mouse, you get organism profiling, but you also get this functional aspect of it. But strictly with the functional uh, profiling, um, we are able to recapitulate um, what we see via 16S profiling. So um, on the left here, you see 16S profiling. Um, we have four different, uh, we have samples from four different mice types. So in blue are lab mice, in green are germ-free lab mice that were reconstituted with a lab microbiome. In red, you have germ-free lab mice that were uh, reconstituted with a wild microbiome. And then in yellow, you see, uh, oops, um, in yellow, you see um, the wild mouse uh, microbiome. And so this is a, a Bray Curtis PCOA of um, the taxa table that came out of 16S profiling. And you see this very nice uh, differentiation between um, all the different sample types. And interestingly, if we take the keg um, taxa table and we do Bray Curtis distance and um, make a PCOA of that, 
we're able to essentially recapitulate exactly what we saw in 16S strictly with functional profiling. So again, we see the lab reconstituted mice in green here cluster nicely, the blue lab mice cluster very nicely here, the wild uh, reconstituted mice cluster very nicely here, and then the, the wild mice are a little more dispersed here in terms of functional profile than what we saw with 16S, but again, um, it's very easy to differentiate these different um, sample types um, strictly via functional profiling. And then interestingly, what you're able to do with this then is with the functional profiling, you're able to figure out sort of um, which keg orthology groups might be driving samples to different quadrants of the plot here. So which keg orthology groups might be more important for one sample type versus another. So in the top right here, we have uh, an rRNA methyltransferase, so something involved um, presumably in uh, regulating protein expression. Um, on the bottom here, bottom right, we have an ATP binding cassette, which is involved in energy metabolism to move things across um, a membrane. On the bottom left here, we have a flavodoxin NADP plus reductase, so again, um, involved in energy metabolism, but um, differentially than um, this ATP binding cassette. And I think what was most interesting when I started looking at this was um, this top left here where we see sort of the wild mice, uh, the wild reconstituted mice, as well as the wild mice. We see this um, outer membrane multidrug efflux system. So if you remember back when I was talking about the abstract, one of the hypotheses in this study was that wild mice are challenged with a much greater variety of um, challenges, for lack of a better word, than lab mice are and it might be conferring um, some benefit to um, the wild mice. And so this multidrug efflux system might be um, sort of reflective of that in that these wild mice, um, the, the microbiomes of these wild mice are encountering, you know, invading pathogens at a, you know, higher rate than what we see in lab. Um, and so, you know, they're going to be encountering antimicrobial genes um, or antimicrobial proteins um, at a sort of greater rate than what we see in the lab. And so this multidrug efflux system might be involved in um, helping the wild mouse microbiome stay established as pathogens start to invade. So this was a really nice thing to see to sort of circle back to um, the original hypotheses of this paper. So in summary, um, DivDB mouse um, increases organismal mapping rates um, compared to what we see with our standard DivDB um, database to the point where DivDB mouse for mouse samples, we see mapping rates that are on par with DivDB for human samples. Um, and one of the more interesting things is that functional annotations provided by DivDB mouse very much recapitulate what we see with 16S data, but then they're also able to provide sort of functional insight into um, what might be driving differentiation between different sample types. And so we feel like uh, DivDB mouse should be utilized for analyzing microbiome of any mouse or humanized, humanized mouse studies going forward um, because you're going to get, you know, sort of more insights than you would get from traditional 16S sequencing. And our database uh, performs quite a bit better than um, other publicly available databases. And so with that, um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Kranti. He is one of our R&D uh, bioinform bioinformatics scientists, um, and he was really instrumental in sort of driving this um, project forward and um, sort of developing and implementing the database. Um, and we have our contact information there, and I will take any questions. Thank you.